Um, I'm going to suggest we kick off. First of all, thank you very much for coming to our session, Graph AI, Get Ready for the New Wave of AI. Um, I appreciate that we're in either the lunchtime or the immediate post-lunch time slot, so we will aim to keep you entertained um, and informed during this session. Um, and I'm sorry we can't all be there in person to um, to kind of experience this and, and discuss and, and learn together. So just to talk through um, who we are, a bit of introduction, um, and then what we're going to talk about. So Ioannis, do you want to um, give us an, an introduction to yourself? Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. So my name is Yanis. Um, I'm a data scientist at Benzing B. My background is both on uh, academia and industry. And uh, that has given to me the opportunity to use uh, machine learning methods that are from uh, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning, and combine those with uh, knowledge graph uh, solutions that we currently use in Engine B for tasks mainly such as anomaly detection, name entity retrieval, and others. Uh, in the slides that will follow, we will see some examples about uh, anomaly detection and how those notes with the presentations actually mean important things for our tasks. Over to you, Frankie. Thank you. Thanks, Janice. Um, so I'm head of audit and ethics here at Engine B. So I trained as a, a chartered accountant and a data scientist at the same time within a public sector audit, audit organization. Um, so I'm uh, absolutely committed to this idea of applying technology to professional services. Um, and at Engine B, I make sure that everything we do for audit gen uh, specifically, but for professional services more broadly as well, is appropriate and relevant and meets the needs of our professional services users. Um, I build relationships with the profession and I'm, uh, I'm responsible for developing our vision for what audit might look like in the future. Um, and I think knowledge graphs are absolutely the answer to that question. Um, and we're really excited to talk to you a bit about why today. So we'll give a very brief intro to Engine B before we start and then talk about the challenges for facing, uh, facing professional services um, with regards to modernization, but also just in the market generally. Um, we'll then talk a little bit about technology solutions before I hand over to Yanis, who will talk um, at much more length about the knowledge graph, the technology and what kind of graph algorithms you can apply um, and the application of that to professional services. And then we'll leave plenty of time with the end for a QA. and a um, so please pop your questions in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll pick them up at the end um, and answer them. So without further ado, who are NGMB? So we're a startup, we're a couple of years old now and we specialise in uh, using AI and data analytics for professional services. At the core of what we do is extracting data from uh, client organisation systems and conforming it into a common data model, which is part of Microsoft's um, industry data workbench. Um, it's a, a public open source common data model that anyone can use uh, for audit and we're building for legal and tax. The idea is to solve that problem that organisations have, that professional services firms have, of lots of data all in siloed spaces uh, that don't connect together. So we extract that data, we tidy it, conform it to the common data model, and then we put it into a knowledge graph which captures the connections between it, and we enable modernization and uh, the adoption of technology in these firms. So why do we do this? And it, it's because there's a number of very significant challenges in professional services at the moment. So in the audit market particularly, but in other markets as well, there's a huge market inequality where uh, a very small number of very large firms are able to take on the work of the biggest, most complex companies in the world. But most other firms are shut out. And that means there's a lack of competition. And actually, that drives a lack of quality. Um, and uh, repeat failures of professional services firms to deliver what they need to do. This is most commonly seen in audit with major audit failures like Carillion or Patisserie Valerie where frauds or, or overtrading was just not spotted. We're also for all professional services firms in this environment of increasing complexity where the companies that you are offering advice to or assurance to are increasingly complex. They've got more and more systems. They measure more and more information and that data flow gets bigger and bigger and faster and faster. And the world is getting bigger and faster and, and professional services firms are really struggling to keep up. In addition to that, 
basically every professional services firm is now being asked not just to provide the traditional advice or assurance that they used to be able to do, but they're being increasingly pushed by clients to deliver insight, to go a little bit further, to add more value, to, to provide more knowledge about how the client's business is functioning. And that, along with the other challenges we've talked about, is decreasing profitability. Because, of course, the, the need to deliver insight means you have to do more work, you have to delve deeper, you have to find out more. And that decreasing pro profitability is a particular problem because the professional services industries haven't modernised. So they haven't really, in most cases, automated even the most basic functions. And it takes an awful lot of human effort to do things like data tidying, data preparation, data reconciliation, just pulling bits of information together. Um, and of course, professional services firms hire largely experts to do that work. They're quite expensive. Um, they're reasonably well paid. And uh, that has a huge impact on the bottom line. And there is from the public as well, this expectations gap about what professionals are doing and what they're able to do. We talk about this most explicitly with audit, with the public perception that the auditor is there to identify fraud. And that's not necessarily what auditors think that they have been doing historically. It's increasingly what they're gonna be relied on to do um, if we see uh, current legislative changes brought in, but it's not what they're set up to do at the moment. And the, the gap between what the public expects and what the auditor can deliver is increasing and the same is true for for example legal services or tax services where the public has an expectation that those professionals will be thinking about money laundering they will be thinking about compliance they will be joining up the dots and those firms just aren't structured to do that with their information so big challenges facing the market um, and a real need to modernize that that's being hampered by a lack of technology at the moment so what NGMB does is it attempts to provide technology solutions to this, and we're finding that um, they're welcomed with absolutely open arms because the professional services firms recognise how difficult this is. So we, as I mentioned before, we ingest structured and unstructured data. So data from systems within the client company, but also things like leases or contracts um, or information from outside. So maybe government information or published accounts or uh, other uh, advice information data that's available on the web. We put it into our common data model for audit that is now ready and open source for legal and tax, it's in development, and that enables the application of, of analytics immediately to automated scale. And one of the things NGB is seeking to do is to kick off a marketplace for technology providers where there's a common data format and a tech company can come in, develop a tool that delivers something and can deliver it on top of Engine B so that there can be a competitive marketplace for technology. We then also put the information into a knowledge graph that captures all of the relationships between the different data points, different data elements, and enables rich querying and rich analysis of those connections and the behaviors of the data in that context-driven way. And that enables us to take steps towards things like immediate assurance. That's matching up documents in multiple ways to check that they're consistent, or it's finding the inconsistencies between documents, doing analysis that enables you to see where items don't match or they don't tally, which allows the human expert, instead of spending ages tying together the information at a basic level, to look at the information together as a whole in a coherent way and apply their judgment. So that's a bit of an overview about what we're doing and, and why uh, professional services uh, need this knowledge graph technology and, and how it's beginning. I'm going to hand over now to Ioannis, who can talk through those knowledge graphs that's at the core of what we're doing in more detail. Thank you very much, Frankie. And hi, everyone, again. So um, as Frankie mentioned, uh, we use knowledge graph technology mainly because we want to represent the information in ways that we can understand better because we visualize this information. So related areas, uh, as you may have heard, are the graph theory, where we are investigating the topology of the graphs, along with the algorithms. The semantic web, where the goal is for the web to, uh, for the web data to be, read, to be read from machines. And you have probably heard again, uh, languages such as the OWL that is the, uh, ontological representation of information can be now read from machines just to understand automatically this hierarchy that may reside within our data. Uh, this information can also be used in the knowledge graphs, 
But another important area that is relevant is the web intelligence that investigates the intersection between the artificial intelligence and the world wide web, where the goal here is, of course, to have web services that are intelligent and efficient towards uh, the user needs. Now, with the graph topology, we mean these two basic elements, that is the nodes and the edges. By nodes, we mean the entities, the objects or events that have some important meaning for our task. These usually have a set of properties, that is attributes, and this uh, characterize and define all of those uh, important features that these nodes bear for this particular task that we are investigating. And of course, by edges, we mean the relationships, connections, or even bonds. Uh, all of these are synonyms between our nodes that uh, specify which comes close to each other and which has a direct, if you wish, um, effect on what we are investigating. Now, there are many major companies that uh, use knowledge graphs. Between those are Google, Twitter, Microsoft, eBay, Airbnb. These are uh, major companies that utilize knowledge graphs within their services and their infrastructures as they aim to understand better how the information um, connects and make sense for the various tasks that they are using. Uh, if we can please go to the next slide, Frankie. Here we will see an example that is from Neo4j. And Neo4j is the graph database platform that we use. And in this platform, uh, that is an app. Imagine you can have other apps that are better towards visualizations, such as Bloom, for example, or apps that provide us with the capability of using graph algorithms, such as Neuler, that is the graph data science library. And this is where we can easily uh, create algorithms that uh, utilize this graph information and provide us with results that are useful for our task. Uh, other important terms are, of course, the graph database schema. And by schema, we mean this blueprint, imagine, of our graph database, where from a very high level, we identify all of the different uh, nodes and relationships that uh, correspond to the task that we are investigating. And then based on that, we construct our graph database. Now, the graph database contains information with all of our nodes, all of our relationships, all of the node properties, and even properties about the relationships that they may be for our task, just for us to be able then to represent this information with a knowledge graph through particular queries, imagine, as we bring some uh, subsections of this knowledge and visualize, and then we can further uh, work with these knowledge graphs based on uh, the graph algorithms that we think apply for this case. As you can see now here in this screenshot, we have used different colors to define the different entities that we take into consideration in this audit task. You will see journal, high risk, a user, a business units, and so on. These are some uh, entities that bear significance to our task. And of course, the links can be directed, as we can see, if there is a meaning behind that, of course, with the particular names but we can have also undirected connections and also more than one connections if, again, this bears some significance to our task. Can we please go to the next one? Uh, slide, Frankie. Thank you. So uh, let's investigate now the advantages behind using knowledge graphs. I think that the most important characteristic is this easy visualization that they provide, especially comparing to um, this uh, uh, modular, uh, tabular view that we can have in the SQL databases, for example. And of course, the benefit of exploration, meaning that you can go in your knowledge graph, you can investigate, you can literally traverse from node to node 
and understand better what's happening between the connection of those uh, important for your task uh, entities. Another important part is that with the creation of the knowledge uh, base, we encapsulate expert knowledge. And this is a very important step as then we can use this expert knowledge with our graph algorithms in order to produce something uh, significant. Um, it is based on the object-oriented concept, if we would like, of course. That means we can have this hierarchical view that we can find in an ontological graph, for example, in our knowledge graph still. The interpretation is quite thorough for the purposes that I mentioned before. So we can have this explainability as to why the information is uh, composed in this way, but also why the algorithms produce these results and uh, to state it as simply as possible, why does my information look in this particular way? That of course helps us uh, in terms of reliability to easily solve our problems because by uh, drawing these things and representing them with these visualizations, we make it quite clear to understand exactly what interacts with that. Um, in regards to the performance, there is a lot of analysis that has been made and uh, compares the tabular uses with the uses of uh, the knowledge graphs and shows how uh, fast the knowledge graphs are in terms of processing times and also in terms of parallel executions and queries. So that means they're quite flexible as well. But overall, I think that the most important thing is that the user, by visualizing and deeply understanding this information, starts building trust towards the system. Because in the tasks such as uh, those that Frankie described, that is anomaly detection, we really need this, tra this trust as it is a very significant task to uh, carry. I will please go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, in this particular example, now we see an actual screenshot from our UI uh, that we have in Engine B, where you can see on the left-hand side the actual knowledge graph. All of these rectangular boxes are our entities that were previously in circles. This example is based on the general ledger table in audit. And you can see all of these different entities correspond to information such as the GL account, the journal line item, um, customers, business units, all of this information that we want to consider when we are performing this anomaly detection task. Now, um, as you can see, we still have our relationships just to understand what connects with that, what is directly um, uh, comparable to. And of course, we have some indications as to whether the high risk criteria were met, because in NGMP, we also use rules that correspond to the first steps that an auditor would take when they go through uh, the list with the records and they try to understand if there is something suspicious going on or not, but also indication about the machine learning methods and whether they have identified the same outlier or not. By having all of this extra evidence, the auditor then is feeling more um, confident in the work that they are performing. And this uh, whole concept narrows down this investigation path that they follow when it comes to understand uh, if the actual or if the outlier is an actual outlier or if it is based because of uh, some kind of a poor uh, data situation, for example. In the UI, we can also have all of the rest of the information. You can see that we have all of the properties of a node, as we described before. And these are all of the main features that correspond to our node. And of course, um, and this is just a screenshot of our program that shows how easy and important at the same time it is, given that the auditor has to deal with all of these values, tables, with uh, black and white information, if you wish, 
Now, just to make it easy to visualize and understand these results better. Can we please go to the next one? Um, thank you. And with this slide, we are going to investigate the various families of the graph algorithms. And these families are five. And I would like to mention at this point that the reason that we use the graph algorithms is because they provide us with this deep interpretation of our knowledge graphs and in turn of our knowledge base. The first uh, family is called the community-based algorithms. And by communities, we mean all those nodes and relationship hubs that are formed in the graph. And they allow, of course, easy visualization, understanding, but also um, we can confirm whether the elements are similar or not. An example for that would be the weekly connected components where as the name suggests, we investigate all of our hubs and then uh, let's say that we are performing some kind of anomaly detection. The main idea here is to understand which are those distant, uh, less connected hubs that might be suspicious for this case. The centrality algorithms are a second family of algorithms that consider the importance that the nodes have in the overall uh, architecture. And by importance, we mean the popularity or we mean the influence. For example, as uh, PageRank does, where it creates a list where we have in a ranked order from the most ranked to the least ranked, all of our nodes with the relationships uh, that reside within our graph uh, representation. There are also the path finding algorithms where we have most of our shortest path algorithms and we want to use shortest paths, especially in cases where we know that these two nodes are suspicious and we want to know what happens uh, directly between them. With the similarity algorithms, that is a fourth family, uh, we are identifying concepts such as the neighborhoods and overlapping similar sections, in other words, that are formed by algorithms such as the K nearest neighbor. We imagine we set again an initial data point that is a node in this particular case. Uh, the relationships that we are interested in taking into consideration and then a value that matters to us for this particular task. And then the algorithm finds the immediate neighborhood around this particular data point, because according to the theory, at least, if you know that an, a node is suspicious, then the immediate neighborhood might be suspicious as well. Mm -hmm. So it would be a good next step in your investigation path. And the last uh, family that I think is very, very interesting is the graph embeddings, because with the graph embeddings through the neural network uh, architectures, we can get the graph topologies converted into a set of vectors. And then we use these vectors as just a set of numbers in this particular case for classification purposes, to make recommendations, to perform similarity um, tasks, or even to predict how uh, the information might evolve after that. An example is the node to VEC, and this is based also on the uh, embeddings that is used um, in the textual formats too. Uh, you have probably heard about the word to VEC2, that is in concept at least a similar architecture. Can we go to the next one, please? Thank you. Um, this is where we will investigate now the advantages of the graph algorithms and especially over using a standalone machine learning. Um, what we do in NGB is we use sometimes machine learning and we include these results to our graph. And then based on the results that we get with our graph algorithms, we reinforce, if possible, our evidence just to make it even more easy for the auditor to take decisions as as to whether this data point is indeed um, malicious or not. The graph algorithms on their own are power tools for the data analysis, because as we mentioned, they encapsulate easily the expert knowledge because this is represented in our graph database, and then we can use that. 
but they also offer the full potential out of the knowledge graph. But the idea, as I described, is that with the knowledge graph information, we can also enhance the results that we get from our typical uh, machine learning methods that we like to use, as we reinforce then our output, because we also take the graph perspective, if you wish, of this particular problem. Uh, we can also go through the thorough interpretations that I described before, but also we get the expert knowledge as an extra validation layer. Because even the expert then can be the user in this case and get a better understanding of whether these results are indeed important for our task or not. Over to you, Frankie. Thank you again. Thanks. I think one of the, the core useful things about knowledge graphs um, is precisely that that, that Ioannis has just talked about, that it, it allows um, the auditor or the lawyer or the expert in professional services to, to interact with the data in this really connected way to provide their input and to understand things in context. And, and I've seen that the impact that that can have on, on work quality straightforwardly myself. And, and that's really what, what speaks to the value of graph technology in professional services. Before graph AI, we have silos of unconnected information. We have multiple databases. We can combine them using things like key codes, putting things into relational databases, but you have to perform linear analysis. And it's tricky to perform machine learning on multiple data sources. You're often limited to one at a time, particularly in an environment where you can't afford a really big data science team. With graph AI, though, the information is fully connected. It provides a huge amount of real world context. So bringing in the external data that's relevant um, is much, much easier, particularly um, with NGB, we have a number of API connectors to places like Companies House, for example, that bring that information in. You can do the like, querying for all of your data in one location. And you can also do this topographical analysis that Johannes has been talking about that, that shows you the shape of the information um, and gives you that extra layer of detail and context and, and richness when you're doing your analysis. And of course, it makes consistency checking really, really easy um, and really straightforward. And a big part of what we need to do in professional services is that consistency checking. So that's us for now. Um, I wanted at this point to hand over to, um, to the Q&A and see what questions we've got. Um, so, uh, Ioannis, we have a question here from uh, Eugene um, asking, is this a reference for the data consolidation task? And a follow up, I think, there was the interest of all these algorithms for business use cases, things like centrality and no tune back. Yeah, I think that the answer is probably common to all this. Um, it really depends on how you um, represent your information in a knowledge graph, because there are many different ways to do that, as we have seen. Uh, it is a skill that comes with experience. There are many different ways to represent, but then there are also many ways to analyze this information with your graph algorithms. So based on the family then of the graph algorithm, we can identify what is needed based on the questions, of course, that we have formed before. And for those questions, uh, someone like uh, Frankie, uh, in the case of audit, who is an audit expert, could be the perfect person to uh, uh, take the advice from, form the questions, use the corresponding representation, and then the corresponding algorithms to bring the solutions and answers to those questions. Great. Thank you, Ioannis. Um, and we've now got a question um, from Neil, uh, which is, when you transfer data from a legacy system, do you then maintain it completely in the graph database, or do you continually refresh it from an ongoing legacy system that's still being used? Um, I mean, I sense that the answer here is going to be it could be either. What Engine B does is we are extracting data from a, a customer system for the professional services firm to use. So it's the professional services firm's version of that data. It's repeatedly refreshed. But Ioannis, can, can you use a, a, a knowledge graph um, and a common data model as, as a standard way of holding your data going forward? This, this is, again, a very good question because you can, if you want, pass this information from the common data model and then from the common data model make your representation. But you can also 
uh, represent your common data model based on how your graph database looks like. So this is again a decision that corresponds more to what are the kind of uh, solutions that you are trying to provide. If you pass the information first from a common data model, um, at least in theory, you will have a more tabular view in your graph representation, while with the opposite way, you give more flexibility inside your graph database, but then the task become harder to understand of what is the tabular representation that I want to make as a next step when I'm extracting this information then out of my common data model. So these are very good questions, but they have a lot of answers that are based on the business questions that uh, I think we are trying to answer. Great, thanks, Jonas. So we have some follow-ups here from Eugene um, asking, what's the edge in comparison with classic data, gov, cataloging, and can you compare your solution to industry data models? Oh, Jonas, are you still there? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'm trying to follow the questions too. Thank you, Frankie. So what's the edge in comparison with the classic data, gov, catalog. So imagine that, at least to my understanding, we take the information of this, catalog, of this catalog in a tabular representation, but we do not really know how the representations are, or how the entities within the representations are connected between them. So the edge really here is to understand how all of these various entities that reside within this catalog are connected within each other, and then rather than performing exhaustive searches through the tables or algorithms that are based on that, you can use these dynamic capabilities that the graph algorithms offer to you and get the information such as which is the most popular entity that means something for me in this particular classic uh, government catalog, which are the least popular entities in this case, and of course, why does this uh, make sense for this particular task? Great, thank you, Johannes. Uh, we have uh, an anonymous question now. If one wanted to begin to utilize graph technology in a different sector, would you recommend Neo4j and what kind of limitations does it have? Um, in Neo4j, I think it's a great technology. Um, it's the only technology that I have used so far so I'm not aware of uh, advantages and disadvantages when compared to others, but based on what I have gathered so far, uh, it provides any kind of flexibility, meaning easy a representation, easy visualization, because it has all of these sub-apps like Bloom, for example, to represent your information. Uh, in regards to the graph algorithms, it makes it very easy to start working with them start trying them without actually dealing programmatically at this level with, uh, uh, with their concepts. It provides you this uh, capability of the actual implementation for you that you can work further with that. And then of course, as these are library calls, someone who is uh, more interested into finding the particulars about the implementations can follow those implementations and start getting a better understanding of uh, what they actually do. So I, I haven't found any limitation, to be honest, so far when using Neo4j, and it makes it quite easy even when we are using external machine learning sources and we are called to bring forth this information to this technology. I'd, I'd add to that that we um, we also use a technology called Bloom, which sits on top of Neo4j and gives us a really easy to use, uh, very straightforward visualization of the knowledge graph. Um, and I found that particularly very useful as someone who's not involved in the code these days on a day-to-day -day basis to, to um, help for presentation and for understanding of the querying as well. Bloom is really, really useful um, and I'd recommend that. Although, of course, it's not a fully functional um, a fully interactive UI. Um, so we thank you, Eugene, for your suggestion. We will definitely look into that. Question yeah. from Rex. Can we define Engine B as a consultancy that uses Neo4j as a tool analogous to an accountant using Excel? I think that's um, 
That's a really good question. I think in a sense, yes, we use Neo4j at the moment as part of our technology stack um, to build either consultancy or general release to the market technology for professional services firms. So Neo4j is one of the tools we use. It's the tool we currently use for knowledge graphs. Is that fair? Yeah. Great. Excellent. Um, and you answer another one for you. Could you associate database models with your graph? Um, yes, absolutely. And uh, this, I think, is where the challenging but the most interesting part is when you are trying to understand how to make your tables an actual graph. This is what we have been doing uh, with anomaly detection in the cases of uh, audit, where we take, for example, the general ledger table and we try to visualize all of those important components within our graph that uh, bear this significant information that helps this uh, anomaly detection task. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, but there again are many ways to do this representation. Um, there are many books that have been written. Uh, some are provided that are great books for free, again, from Neo4j, where they provide some uh, advice as to what is the best way to represent information when you have a particular task or even when you have a particular story or even when you have uh, tabular data. So I, I'm sure you will find very good examples in those uh, free books that are provided for uh, Neo4j too. I'd also say if you're interested in the graph, Neo4j itself has, um, it, it's quite easy to set up and just start playing around with. And I know um, um, I, someone I uh, have worked with variously that I, I was talking to them about Neo4j, they, they work in the audit space in the public sector in Europe. And um, they moved from downloading Neo4j onto their machine to having an audit finding in the space of a working week. They found that the, the graph connections were so powerful and, and that the tool itself was so easy to use. So can really recommend it from that point of view. So you answer another couple of questions about algorithms here, take them one at a time. Um, a lot of graph algorithms, especially the more novel machine learning ones are available in Python, like Network X. Is it possible? And if so, is there a benefit to using the A4J with Python? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You can use Python uh, with Neo4j. And um, usually in Neo4j, you use Cypher code. But yes, the answer is yes, you can also use Python to perform similar tasks as well. They have very nice uh, APIs for that. Excellent. Um, and we've also been asked for an example of a business case for Node2Vec or other algorithms we've talked about. So business use cases for Node2Vec. Um, the Node2Vec, as we mentioned before, is a graph embedding algorithm. That means it takes the topology of your graph and produces um, a set of numbers, that is vectors. So business use case for that would be when you are trying to make recommendations in your business and you want to know what kind of information you have represented, how similar these topologies are also depends on what kind of recommendations you will make. Uh, other use cases based on classification tasks that uh, you may uh, want to involve in your business, such as, I know that this graph for me means something in particular. It could be talking about the sport. It could, it could be a profile of something. So given that I have the numbers of that and I can use a classifier, to classify this information, label this information, and start collecting topologies, I can then also start predicting topologies based on this information um, without me having to go through the actual topological information and visualization in order to do that. Great, thank you. Um, Eugene, I'm afraid we we don't talk about which precise algorithms we use in our specific solutions because of course that then becomes commercially confidential um but of course we're, we're happy to talk kind of more in general terms um rex if you have hundreds of thousands or hundreds or thousands of pages of unstructured data are nlp algorithms used to define the nodes and edges it's a great question Johannes. this is something we were talking about earlier this morning yeah 
Um, so yes, that's a great question. It's a great challenge. Um, MER, that is a named entity retrieval, is being used for these cases as long as algorithms that try to understand then what are the relationships between, between the entities that you have extracted. And then I think after you have achieved that, the rest is quite straightforward when it comes to load this information then into your uh, graph database and represent. So yes, the challenging part is the first one, but there are many solutions that uh, are currently being given um, in the World Wide Web, um, scientific papers and other resources. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Rex, your point is, is particularly well taken because the um, the data we use in professional services, of course, is, is often long, it's often unstructured, it's often really complex. Um, one thing that the NGV Knowledge Graph is being built to do at the moment, for example, is read in the disclosure notes, the accounts. Um, that's obviously, as you say, pages and pages, at least hundreds, uh, some of the time, of unstructured data, quite complex, quite rich data. Um, and we are using and we're beginning to train NLP that can develop nodes and edges out of that um, and we do a human in the loop um, process to make sure that the expert agrees with the, the NLP output there. Um, we're doing something similar with um, lease contracts as well to develop knowledge graphs um, out from the common data model and leases, which of course can run for you know, as long as the, the lawyers might want. Um, and, and again, NLP is, is a, an absolutely critical tool in our arsenal to achieving that. Um, yeah, Johannes, uh, we have a question about the size of knowledge graphs. Um, yes, which is this question? Uh, so this is Eugene's question. Can you cite the size of your knowledge graph like a thousand terms and hundreds of relations? I think we're talking much bigger than that in, in some of our more recent projects. Oh yes, absolutely. I'm just trying to, to find the question to get a better understanding. Uh, so I'm seeing it as the top question at the moment uh, on the Q and A. Right. Thank you, Frankie. Sure. Yes. So yes, uh, I would say that probably decades of um, thousands of nodes, along with relationships, would be um, a use case. Um, that you can work with, yes. If not thousands, yes, decades of thousands. Yeah, and I think our, our common data model, um, the core common data model for audit definitely has, um, I would say, probably nearly a thousand data attributes in it, so, so particular nodes in it that, that could be included. We are looking to expand it and it will go go greater than that. And of course, you've got the individual relationships between data points sort of conceptually, but then you've got the, the relationships between actual data points, which of course get much richer. So as soon as you have a database of any size, um, you, 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 they really get very, get very big very quickly. And one of the benefits of knowledge graphs is that it enables a kind of um, a powerful semantic search through those relationships. Could you share your methodology, how you built your graphs working with clients? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you want to do you, do you want to talk a bit about that? I mean, some of it is internal to Engine B, some of it is in collaboration with clients, some of it is across the industry, bringing together industry groups. Yeah. So, uh, methodology while building graphs. Um, definitely, as you mentioned, working with clients as uh, expert knowledge is coming from them. Uh, most of the times, as it is based on their needs to understand how to represent the information in the knowledge uh, graph database. Um, and then it's also a matter of uh, what kind of questions will be formed, this kind of information. What are the tasks, in other words, that you are trying to uh, achieve and problems that you are trying to solve? Um, in regards to the methods, which are the graph algorithms that you are going to take into consideration that you think are going to provide you with answers for these solutions? Other questions would be, would only the graph algorithms, and this is what we also do in NGMB, to understand if only with the graph algorithms we'll be able to provide these answers or also combine 
uh, machine learning methods with those graph algorithms to come to a more accurate conclusion. So I would say that in a nutshell, these are the kind of uh, decisions that we take and we consider when it comes to solve these kind of problems. But the most important, I think, is the way that you represent this information in your graph as based on this information, the graph algorithms are then going to produce results. If this is a poor information, the results will be poor. If the information is quite complicated, I would bet the same uh, the results would look like. So it's just to find this uh, golden line, I would say, between what are your requirements and what is the size of information and way of representing the information in your graph database and that will allow you to use the corresponding algorithms. I would agree with all of that. And um, Ioannis and I work quite closely on, on um, graph design and, and graph building for particular use cases. And the thing I'd say that's most important from my experience coming more from the subject matter expert point of view is the, the, the graph design and graph building process is iterative. So you, you take one version of the data that you've got, you build a graph, you possibly apply some machine learning on it, and then you see what strengths and weaknesses are, you redevelop, you redesign, you think about new questions, and, and it, it keeps growing from there. So um, we, as I imagine everybody does, we use quite an agile process for our projects, and we consider our graph to be alive. Um, and um, on, on that basis, that kind of iterative process of graph building is also a form of learning, even if it's not automated learning. Um, and Eugene, I hope I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but thank you so much for your questions. Uh, we have a question from Chris now. Um, is it possible to use graphs to discover the business logic and conditions contained in a data set? Or does that have to be applied through, for example, subject matter expert input? Ioannis, what do you reckon on this? Um, business logic and conditions contained in a data set. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in engine B, a knowledge engineer is uh, actually responsible for uh, representing this information into the knowledge graph. So as long as this information is uh, representative and makes sense to the knowledge engineer, then there is definitely no need for uh, another type of input for this work. But sometimes, especially in the tabular cases, you find that there is some information missing from these tables that would make sense in the graph. So these are the cases where you actually want to approach the experts and ask their opinion on this task. So I, I'm giving this uh, um, fuzzy answer, like saying 60% uh, yes, you are probably okay with the information that you have there, but 40% of the time you probably need some further information just to make sure that your graph is rich enough to answer your questions. And please, yes, uh, Frankie, give us your input too, as you are the expert again in this case. Yeah, I would say that that completely aligns with my experience that I, as a subject matter expert, um, and working with other subject matter experts can often say, I am interested in asking this question of the graph. I am interested in knowing this bits of information about graph topology or, or about the data and the graph can answer that. But very often, um, Ioannis and colleagues um, and the knowledge engineers and the data scientists will come to me and say, we have applied this algorithm or we can apply this algorithm and this implies these relationships or it implies these um, logics are occurring. There is a statistically relevant um, graph topology going on that has not been picked up by any of your um, by any of your proposals that you've made. Um, is this a relationship? Is this something you want to consider? And and so again, it comes back, I think, to this iterative process that you can pick up quite a lot um, of relationships within the data, particularly around the behaviour of data. Data that. Um, information that isn't necessarily captured in data structures, um, but you will probably want a subject matter expert or at least someone who understands the how the data gets into the system in the first place um, or how it relates to each other to begin the graph building so that you can then apply that kind of analysis. 
Uh, just quickly uh, mention to Rex that the answer is yes. It is NLP algorithms used to define the nodes or end edges. As we discussed before, and in particular, name entity recognition and the corresponding algorithms that detect the relationships between those. Yeah, absolutely. And Chris, I think the point you've made there is, is for me a really crucial one, particularly in professional services. Um, this idea that the technology provides information that can then be considered or verified by an SME is crucial. Um, I think graphs come into their own in these environments where we don't necessarily want I mean, I'm sure they can be used for automatic decision making and for prediction um, and decision and that kind of thing. I'm absolutely certain of that. But for me, they provide a way of performing machine learning, particularly, but performing analysis, really heavy lifting analysis in a way that makes it very easy, actually, for a subject matter expert who is not a data expert to understand the data. And that's crucial in environments where law or regulation requires that a human being make a decision. I also think it can be more ethical um, because it, it makes your decision making better quality, it provides more context and it, it obviates the, the need to automate huge amounts of decision making because it's much easier to see the, the data. Um, and, and so for me, I think graphs at the moment are the gold standard for human in the loop um, presentation of an understanding of data. Um, this is because another, another colleague of ours um, talks about graphs as brains. Right, it's a connection of different neurons, it's a connection of different bits of information. Um, it's a very intuitive way of, of understanding data and understanding information. Great. We have a few more minutes if there are any more questions. Thank you so much for the for the quality of the discussion we've had so far. Um, and of course, we um, we can be reached if people want to follow up. Um, you can always contact us. Uh, at these spaces and um, and we'd be happy to answer questions or, or talk to anybody about that kind of thing. And if anyone's doing any research into uh, graph algorithms um, or knowledge graphs, then um, get in touch. We're always keen. I think it's fair to say, isn't it, Ioannis, to stay up to date with the latest developments? Absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone. Wonderful. I'm going to give it a couple of minutes to see if there's any more questions, but then if not, we will. Oh, I can see there's something in the chat. Oh, thank you very much, John. We appreciate that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave the chat open for a couple of minutes in the, the Q&A. Um, but otherwise, yeah, please get in touch. Follow us on LinkedIn or Twitter or wherever you can find us. And um, we look forward to seeing what you guys do with graphs. All right, Johannes, I've got a question for you, just because we've got a few more minutes and I so rarely get to pick your brain in this kind of an environment. What's the most exciting graph application that you're aware of at the moment outside of Engine Leap? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, I would probably say when it comes to use it, you know, for your uh, hobbies, like uh, try to understand how you have organized your uh, um, old videotapes or uh, you know, <laughs> have this database of uh, CDs and everything and you are trying then to find information within mm -hmm. those like in the movies. So that would be something uh, useful that is not related to the business world rather than to your personal free time. And uh, there are many such examples that are provided from Neo4j2. When uh, people in Game of Thrones, for example, after so many episodes were trying to understand whether these particular characters met like with the shortest path algorithm, and if yes, um, which were the intermediate connectors? Like, which were those characters that they both met, but sometimes, you know, they, could, they, they, they never made it, they never found the chance to meet with each other, but if they both talk with this character, if that makes sense. So it's uh, like with the, how many handshakes away we are from someone, concept. Yes. I think that it's a very exciting area to use even for uh, tasks that mean something in particular to you. Yeah. Um, all of this information that we currently have in our tables and database can still be converted to graphs and then mm. use graph algorithms to get a better understanding of that. So there are many, many different cases. Right. I can, I'm sorry, yeah. 
I think that's um yeah that's really interesting and I can already in kind of professional services see applications even for that Game of Thrones example you've just given so if you look at the emails within an organization who is communicating with who and other patterns are there that might be indicative of fraud for example um or do you have particular people emailing um suppliers or um customers or third parties to legal agreements in a way that that might be indicative that there's something going on that's that's risky here you could even sort of track the communications that an organization has with hmrc to see how it's um how its tax affairs are, are being managed etc so i think there's it's got a lot there that's, that's potentially really interesting coming out of some of that network analysis and of course we think naturally of, of networks in a graph form don't we Absolutely, yeah. I think that whenever there is uh, this chance of investigating further any kind of information that you have, whether it is uh, tabular or whether it is some kind of a use case, even a story, as long as you start representing this information and forming bonds between the entities of this information, then this is going to lead you somewhere that uh, in the end will surprise you, like fascinate you. There is always this case that the information we found and we're like, really? Can this be for real? Mm. Yeah. That you were not expecting, but because of the way that you represented everything, but of course, it needs to be as close to the real world as possible, then still surprises you. Great. Thank you, Johannes. Right, I think we'll give all of these nice people three minutes left back um, of their afternoon. Thank you again, everybody, so much for coming. Um, thanks, Johannes. I've really enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> I get to talk to you all the time. So, um, yeah, I hope everybody has Good a lovely one. afternoon. Cheers. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye bye.